over the last 25 years, I'd say the biggest impact that we've made is reducing those that are living in poverty, particularly extreme poverty, by half. Uh, we've seen more than 90% of children get into primary school for a basic education. And we have reduced the rate of children who are dying before their fifth birthday by half. These are remarkable progresses. However, there's still much to do. We're developing a new set of goals. They're universal, they're integrated, and they're over a period of time that we think that we can build on what we have done with the last set of goals. What hasn't worked with the uh, first set of goals that we had uh, was that we really didn't look at the root causes. It was more of addressing some of the symptoms. In the two decades since Mozambique's civil war ended, the country has made an amazing recovery. But not all citizens are participating in the country's new opportunities. Fifteen-year-old Ilsa Guambe is one of them. Ilsa, then just 13 years old, was unable to continue school. In rural Mozambique, moving in with a boyfriend's parents constitutes a marriage. More than half the girls in the country are married before the age of 18, one of the highest rates of child marriage in the world. Well, the story of this teenage girl is, of course, so sad in a country that has so much hope um, with their new dawn, um, that she doesn't have an education, that perhaps her family doesn't have an education, which in turn would have made her better and more equipped to deal with relationships and not end up in the situation that she did. This is part of what we are trying to promote, is that everyone gets an education um, and therefore are empowered to take the decisions that they need to, uh, but also to move governments to put in legislation that actually protects girls. Let us pick up our books and our pens. They are our most powerful weapons. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. Education is the only solution. Education first. Thank you. It reminds me not so long ago where I had my first cousin who um, went to school with me and, and uh, we were growing up together quite happily uh, until my grandmother came to take her away one day and we couldn't quite understand. We just knew that my grandmother was one of those uh, pillars in the family that you didn't argue with. Um, and, and she took her back to the village. She married six children later. And, and when we sit down to reflect on our lives, where I am today and where she is, and, and we know quite clearly had she had an education, she probably would have done much better than I've done because she was so much smarter. Another major challenge is the rise of violent extremism, both a symptom and a cause of lagging development. Boko Haram are still active in northeast Nigeria, and nearly 16 million Nigerians are affected by food insecurity, malnutrition, epidemics and conflict, including these refugees who fled to neighboring Chad after Boko Haram attacks. Well, countering violent extremism around the world, um, I think we do have to address the root causes. I hope that we don't make this a case of a band-aid because it will only fester and, and that means that everyone is insecure regardless of the country that you're in. I can take examples from my own country, the northeast of Nigeria, Meduguri. I went to school there. The young men are not born terrorists. It's an environment that creates that. Um, and we need to look at what happened. How were they so excluded they saw no hope and that they became easy fodder for people uh, to use in the way they have done and, and that becomes a tragedy for everyone. The Pacific Ocean occupies nearly one third of the Earth's surface and contains one of the planet's most diverse ecosystems. Thousands of species thrive in these waters. Pacific coral reefs and the marine environments they sustain provide food and livelihoods for over 120 million people, 
including the inhabitants of a tiny cluster of islands known as the Cook Islands. And for one Cook Islander, the ocean has a deeply personal meaning. At a young age, seven or eight, um, I'd spend every day, you know, in the sea and uh, uh, in the oceans, fishing and uh, out on boats. It just becomes part of you. Though his career as a rugby player took him away from his native Cook Islands, Kevin returned as often as he could. Each time he noticed alarming changes in the ocean. Fishermen catching fewer fish, dying coral, and growing commercial interests pursuing resources around the Cook Islands. I hope for the sake of small islands like that and, and vulnerable communities, even on the oceans, uh, the, the coastlines that we talk about, we see so much investment going in there because trade is important and so ports are being built and where infrastructure is, is happening. But, you know, uh, the rising sea levels are going to take away a lot of those investments that, um, that we're putting down and that will be gains that are lost. Without hope, what else is there? I think that, you know, we, we as the United Nations, that's our job. We can never turn around to the world and say that there is no hope. What else? I mean, you must have hope. <laughs>